Hey friends, in this video we're going to turn this into this. This video is all about turning your boring, lifeless, monotone, sounds like Ableton drum beats into amazing evolving rhythms full of intrigue, style, and originality. All right? Let's get it. Okay, so here's exactly what I'm talking about. There's a drum beat here that is just about as boring as it could possibly be. It sounds very robotic. It sounds, there's just not that much happening. Take a listen. That's just not going to do. Okay, so right away what I hear when I hear this is it sounds robotic. When you listen to someone playing a drum set or you listen to any like really well-crafted beat, the drums are never doing the same thing really twice. There's all kinds of other things going on and it adds interest when the drums are changing in level and volume. Now if you are making a beat with a drum rack, you have simplers inside of it, right? And each one of these simplers you'll notice has a volume to velocity amount. So if I double click on the clip, and I'm looking here at the clip, we can see that down here it says velocity. All right, so this is the note velocity. Now, if we change these velocities around, we can get this drum beat to groove a little bit, okay? So, for example, let's start with the kick. Now, if you turn this headphone icon on, you can click on each one of these, and you can actually hear what it sounds like. If you bring the velocity down, you can hear it keeps playing that kick drum, and as I bring the velocity down, you can hear it gets quieter, right? Right? So what we can do is we can go in here and start moving things around a little bit. Maybe this will be an extra loud hit and this will be a quieter hit. Let's do it the same thing on the hi-hats, except this time I would like the first hi-hat to be loud and the next three to be quieter. So maybe something like this, right? And maybe for the next one, I'll do the same thing, except this one will go lower, this one will start to increase, and this one will start to increase. Do you see how they highlight each time I hover over this? All right, now something else you can do is you can hover over the hi-hat, hold command, and notice how you can just click and drag. So I'm dragging this down. So I'll do the same thing for the last one. And I'll make this one loud just for the heck of it. So now that we've got some velocity, take a listen to the difference. So maybe I'll do the same thing here. Turn this down a little bit. That one down a little bit. Okay, so we're starting to feel like this drum beat is starting to move somewhere. It's starting to change. It's starting to groove a little bit, right? Now, the next thing we want to do is that this is very robotic. This is it's played very straightforward, right? And no human being is going to play like that. A human being, when they play the drum set, they're going to have a little bit of feel associated. So the next thing we can do is we can click on our groove pool by clicking on this little button right here, and we can add some swing to this, just a little bit of swing. So maybe we'll try something like, yeah, 61. You can hear that you can preview, if your little headphone icon is on, you can preview what these swing feels are like, right? Now these basic swing settings will have no velocity information, but since we programmed our velocity in, I'm just gonna use these instead. So let's go ahead and go with, yeah, 64. So I'll click and drag this into my groove pool, and now take a listen to the beat. Boom. Okay, so now we're really starting to get somewhere. Now this has a little bit of feel associated with it. Now, inside of your grooves, you can also pull the timing down a little bit. You can add a little random, and you can just make this a little bit more humanized, if you will, right? So let's take a listen to this now. Random can tend to while out, so you gotta be careful there. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is that this drum beat is all on the grid, right? Of course, with this groove, we're gonna be shifting the 16th notes over just a tiny bit, but it's not visualized, and honestly, when you're playing with a drummer, they might do this on their own. So one thing I wanna talk about doing is taking these hats, okay, I'll just click and drag and select all these hats. I'll hold shift and unselect this percussion hit. What we can do is if we click and then hold command, we can actually pull these hi-hats and make them just a little late, okay? Now take a listen to what this does. Now that might be a bit intense, so I can drag this back just a little bit, maybe something more like this. Boom. That little tiny move can really make a difference when it comes to feel. Okay, and so the next thing I want to talk about is variation. So at this point, we just have this these four bars, right? We have no variation going on. So I'm going to click on this top bar, and you'll notice that everything gets selected in this light blue. If I hit Command-D, 
right? Now we've got two different repetitions of this exact same thing. So I can go ahead and take the second one and change it a bit. So maybe I'll add an extra kick drum there and I'll move this one over. Right? Now something else I wanna talk about is that down here we have velocity, right? If you're rocking Ableton 11, you also have this, which is chance. Now we can add a little bit more variation to this by making it so that some of these notes won't actually fire every time. So maybe I'll make a kick drum here, but I'll take the chance, okay, and I'll bring the chance down. And you can see that it's indicated that there's a lower chance here with this little triangle in the top corner, okay? Same thing I can do, the same thing with perhaps a snare drum. I'll put another snare drum here and I'll take its chance down. I'll add a couple more just for the heck of it. Okay, so now that I've added some of these, every time I play past these notes, they might fire, they might not. Take a listen. So essentially everything that we've done thus far is this is MIDI data, right? We're taking MIDI data and we're inputting velocity, chance, we're inputting note places, we're changing things that have to do with the actual MIDI, right? Where the notes are positioned and what's going to happen with them. So basically I would call this kind of phase one, right? Now phase two is when things start to get really interesting. Hey, I just want to say, if you're on that YouTube grind trying to teach yourself Ableton Live by spending hundreds of hours searching for tutorials, I just want to say there's a better way that could save you literal years of your life. Now, if you like my teaching style, I want you to know that I have absurdly deep, thorough, and optimized Ableton Live courses designed specifically to teach you in a matter of months what took me a decade to learn. These aren't some cheap, crappy Udemy courses. All of my Ableton courses are 20 plus hours of hyper-focused video content with hundreds of lessons designed to be a one-stop shop for learning everything you'd ever need to know. If you sign up, you also get lifetime-long mentorship from me and members of our rapidly growing and awesome Discord server. So stop screwing around. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to it. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna reach for an Ableton glue compressor and start to work on non-linearities. So I'm gonna grab a glue compressor and drop it into here. Now, when I'm looking at glue compressor, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set up compression that will start to take these kind of dry, boring samples and start to add life to them, okay? So I'm gonna take the attack down. I'm still gonna let a decent amount of attack through because I want some of that initial smack to be there. I'll take the release time down a little bit and I'll start to really crunch this down. Now you might be saying, hey, that's a lot of compression and I can barely hear the drums. Well, first of all, that's what the makeup gain is for. So we're reducing well past 10 dB. I'll start to bring the makeup gain up. Now that sounds pretty good. Let's see what happens without it. That sounds pretty good, except what we're now losing is we're losing kind of the body of the drums and it just kind of sounds squashy and pumpy. The reason that I'm compressing this so hard is because the next thing we're gonna look at is the dry wet control. Now what this does is this will basically say all the way at 0%, you're just hearing the dry signal, right? So turning the glue compressor on and off does nothing. But as I increase the wet signal, of course, I get... I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting the nice sustain from the compressor, but I'm also listening to those initial drum hits, right? Cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is that we rarely ever in nature, hear sounds without accompanying reverb, right? No matter where you are, no matter what room you're in, even if you're outside, eventually sound is going to bounce off of something and come back to you. So really when you're making these beats, you gotta add some kind of space for the beat to appear in, right? So let's go ahead and just reach for a basic reverb for now since this will cover what everyone has. So let's take a listen just on this vanilla setting. Obviously, that's not gonna do the trick for us, right? What we wanna do is we're gonna pull this down a little bit, this dry wet control. And the next thing we're gonna work on is trying to dial in what I would consider a drum room sound, okay? So when it comes to a room, our pre-delay is not gonna be that long because the room is kinda small. So somewhere around five milliseconds might work there. 
Next thing I want to talk about is that the diffusion network, I want this, I want the walls of this room to be kind of dark, meaning that they don't reflect a lot of top end. So I'm going to turn the diffusion network top end down a little bit. Next thing I'll do is I'll reach for maybe a mid or high global quality. And let's go ahead and finally take down the decay time and take a listen to this. Now we're giving the drums a place to occupy. Another thing we can do is bring the size down a little bit. Nice. Maybe we'll take the decay time down a little bit more and then I'll turn the dry white down and take a listen to this. Cool. Now, a lot of folks, this is what they'll do and they'll move on, okay? Or they'll put this reverb potentially in a send and send more or less different drums to it. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but what I want to talk about is that usually drum compressors that are on drum kits are set up after they're listening to not only just the close mics on the drums, but also the drum mics in the room, okay? So there's room reverb that's natural where the drum set is sitting before it gets to a bus compressor. So we're going to simulate that by actually taking the reverb and putting it before the glue compressor. Now, if I leave the dry wet where it is now, we're going to get a lot of reverb. Take a listen. Listen to how wet that is. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to bring the dry wet all the way down and start to introduce it slowly until we get what we want. Okay, so take a listen. Now I'm hearing a lot of that kick drum in there, so I'm going to engage the low cut. So as you can see, maybe a dry wet setting of 15% would make a little bit more sense. Now the final thing I want to talk about is shape. Now shape just changes the relationship between the early reflections and the diffusion network. So I think that if I pull the shape down a little bit this way, this might make this sound a bit more natural. Let's take a listen. Beautiful. Now this dry wet is a little bit higher maybe than I would normally set this, but for this specific application, I wanted to make sure that you could hear the difference. So let's go ahead and turn the reverb off and turn it back on. Then you'll really be able to tell what this is adding, okay? Okay, so the next thing I wanna look at is the actual drum rack itself. At this moment, we have the kick drum living in the same drum rack as all the other drums. And this isn't really that advantageous for us if we want to get crazy with this. So the next thing I want to look at is actually extracting chains, okay? So I'm going to click on this guy right here, and I'm going to right-click on this chain. This is where my kick drum is, right? Right-click, extract chains. Now what this will do is it will take the drums, the kick drum, see the kick drum sample is now living in a separate drum rack, and now this drum rack has all of the other samples in it. So I'm gonna take this kick drum and drag it all the way to the beginning. And now when I play these together, it sounds good, the kick drum is out, but you'll notice that all the nice stuff that we did with the reverb and the glue compressor are not applied to the kick drum as well. So the next thing I'll do is I'll click on the first track, shift click on the second one, right click, and group these tracks together, okay? Then I'm gonna grab the reverb and the glue compressor and slap them over here. Okay, so now that this is living, this should sound exactly the same as it sounded before, except the kick drum is now separate from the rest of the drums. Take a listen. Nice. So the next thing I want to talk about is using this kick drum right here to duck the volume of the other drums. So what this is going to do is this is going to kind of simulate what happens when you're slamming the top of a tape bus, right? and it's pushing the entire signal down. Just take a listen to what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna grab a normal compressor and drop it onto the other drums, okay? I'm gonna feed the side chain input, okay, from the kick drum, so that would be two drum rack. I might as well go ahead and name it real quick. This is kick. And so as you can see, in this track, we're taking kick and we're feeding it into the side chain input. I'll bring the ratio all the way up, the attack all the way down, because I want this to be absolute. And I'll go ahead and start bringing the threshold down till it crosses. Also, when we're working with sidechain compressors, using peak mode is always something we're going to want to do because we want it to be absolute. Okay, so take a look now. So now what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and start bringing up the makeup gain to make sure this all makes sense. So I'll shrink this compressor down a little bit. And now we're going to start working with the output gain to get this back up to where it was before.
Now we can hear a kind of pushing and pulling relationship between the kick drum and the rest of the drums, okay? This is what it's like without this. Listen to how lifeless and kind of boring it is. When I turn this on, take a listen. Right, things are kind of reacting differently to that kick drum. Now you can change this relationship by moving the release time around. I have the release time up pretty high right now, but we could get a different sound if I brought it down a bit. It's kind of a more of aggressive sound, and then I would say that at higher settings, it's kind of more of a gentle sound. But doing this trick really can change the character and quality of your drums. And so let's go ahead and take that kind of tape bus idea and kind of run with it by adding a saturator to the drum bus at the very end. Now what we're going to do with this is we're going to drive the signal into the saturator a little bit and compensate by turning the output gain down. This is going to accomplish a couple things. Well, the first thing it's going to accomplish is that it's going to control the dynamics, the peak and RMS levels, so that these drums are easy to mix. But two, what it's also going to do is it's going to give us a little bit of that tape slamming sound we've been talking about. So let's go ahead and try that. I'll put it on soft sign for now. Maybe we'll change the algorithm later, but let's go ahead and start hitting it. Now with this move, I want to drive the signal in, okay, but I also want to equally take the signal out, okay, because I'm not trying to add volume with this. All I'm trying to do is just get a little bit more saturation. So without the saturator, with it, without it, and then with it. Now here's an interesting thing. As you can see, when I play this, the peak signal is getting almost all the way up to zero. But with the saturator on, we're staying around negative six. So that's a really good thing that saturation does for you. It helps you control your dynamics. Now, another thing I want to talk about is that, as you can hear, it sounds more present. It sounds more, more uh, aggressive. It's right there in your face, and it sounds really good. So the next thing, let's talk about these, post, these pre and post filters, okay? So the bass control just feeds more or less of the kick drum into the saturator. At the moment, the low end, probably everything under 100 hertz or something, is coming directly through the saturator. But as I turn this up, we're feeding more of those sub frequencies into the saturator, which can really alter the sound. Let's take a listen. Cool. So now we're starting to get a little bit more character into this, all right? Now the next thing I would do in this case is obviously that's a lot of saturation, so I might take the dry wet and bring it down a little bit. So let's take a listen to without and with the saturator now. So even though we've done a lot of things before this saturator, it still sounds a little robotic. But you turn on the saturator, all of a sudden it's homogenizing all this crazy stuff and bringing it back together. Okay, so check it out. Now the other thing we can do is we can turn the dry wet back up and work on this pre-post filter. Now this is basically saying that at 1K, we're going to either add or subtract that frequency, right? This is a post filter. So let's go ahead and mess with this a little bit. Cool, so it sounds like to me around 400 hertz is something I like. So the funny thing is about this depth control is that when you go up, it actually scoops the signal. And then if I were to go down, it actually boosts the signal. I don't know why it's that way, but that's just how it is. Let's take a listen. One more thing you can do is, is try to add soft clip, which will add a second instance of saturator with the analog clip mode, which will just help you kind of control your dynamics more. Let's see what it sounds like. Actually kind of works for me. All right, so now I'm gonna pull my dry wet back down and make it a little bit more acceptable. Awesome. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is we're gonna go back into the MIDI part of this and let's talk about something else. So what we can do in inside of Simpler to add a little bit more variation is to kinda of think about what happens when you have a room with all kinds of frequencies bouncing around. It doesn't always sound like the drums are coming from exactly the same place. If you've ever sat in a room and listened to a drum set, those bouncing sounds can add a stereo quality. So something else we could do is these percussion sounds whatever these things are, we could randomly pan them around. So I'll click on this first one, okay? I'll head over to my controls, and you can see that there's a random panning control. So let me turn this up to 15%, okay? And something that's really cool about this 
is that you can click on any of these and the same control will show up. So I'll click on the second one, we'll move that around and click on the third one. So now whenever these percussion sounds hit, they're gonna kind of move around in the stereo field. Let's take a listen to this. This is just adding more and more life to this drum beat, right? Awesome, so the final thing I wanna show you I think is a really interesting thing we could do. I'm gonna go down to MIDI effects and I'm gonna choose envelope MIDI. I'm gonna take this envelope MIDI and slap it on the kick drum. All right, so why am I doing this? Well, envelope MIDI is a really interesting device. You can map the output of the envelope that's triggered every time the kick happens and map it to some other thing. So before we map it to something, let's go ahead and we'll take maybe a Redux and put it on the entire kit. So Redux got a really nice facelift in Ableton 11, and I just really like the way that it works. You can add some jitter, it adds some stereo, it's just really nice. Let's take a listen to what happens. So what I'm trying to do with this is simulate what it sounds like to be using like an old like MPC, like drum machine or something. I'm gonna add a little bit of jitter to this, and we're gonna get that kind of like old school sound. Take a listen. That's with it, here's without it. Now, why did I use that envelope MIDI on the kick drum? Well, check this out. I can go to this and I can maybe make an envelope. This is just a classic ADSR envelope that gets triggered every time the kick drum has a note. What I can do is I can take this and maybe I'll use this kick drum signal to map it to that Redux. So I'm going back to my Redux and I'm mapping it to the rate. Now, if I leave it just how this is, take a listen. Now, maybe to some of you, you think that's great, that's cool. If you like it that way, awesome, but I, I'm not really into it. What I wanna do is I wanna go in here and kinda dial this in. So I'll go to the kick drum, and I'll start to mess with the minimum and maximum amount of this mapping, okay? So all the way down, Maybe it would make more sense to be in this area. So now that I've dialed that envelope MIDI up a little bit, you can see that we're just kind of staying in this nice range. Cool, so I might want to push this up just a little bit. Let's go back to the kick. I'll bring both of these numbers up just a little bit, maybe to 90 and 50, and let's see what we got. Now I can always take the dry wet and kind of change this up a little bit. And now that I've added that redux, I'm gonna take this reverb down just a little bit to make it more dialed in. And now because you've got one, two, three different nonlinear effects, the order of them is going to drastically change the way this sounds. So the next thing I'll do is I'll take the redux and put it before the glue compressor and see what we got now. Now the final thing that I want to do, I think the final icing on the cake, would be to use the kick drum, but map it to this drive in reverse, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the kick drum, click on this drop down, and as you can see there's eight destinations I can send it to. I'll click on map, then I'll go over to the saturator and I'll map it to the drive. Now you got to be careful here, this could get pretty intense. The next thing I want to do is I want to say that normally the drive should be around plus eight, okay? That should be its normal setting. So I'm gonna go back to the kick drum and say, okay, it's normal setting will be a little bit above 50%, which is probably close to eight. That's two. Let's get up just a little bit higher. Cool, that's eight. And now the maximum amount will be a lot higher, maybe something like 75. Now check this out. Let's see what this did. Now you'll notice that the drive goes up every time the kick drum hits, but maybe we wanna do this in an opposite way. Maybe we wanna go back to the kick drum and say, instead, let's do 61 when the kick drum hits and higher when it doesn't. This might add a really cool push-pull kind of relationship. Let's take a listen now. Nice, I love it. But what I wanna do is I wanna kinda of dial it back a little bit. So maybe we'll go down to 56 and we'll take this down to like 69 and let's see what happens. It's all about finding that sweet spot. Turn it up a bit. 
Okay, so now that we've made all those changes, let's go ahead and take a listen to our resulting beat. Cool, so hopefully this video has helped demystify some of the techniques when it comes to making beats a little bit less robotic and a little bit more you. All right, so try some of these tactics out and I'll see you in the next video, everybody. Thanks for watching.